Hello everybody. Thanks for tuning in for today's live stream. Uh, we are very proud to be able to host such an event and provide a toolkit to make it happen. Our guest speaker today is the one and only Dr. Gregory Katz. He will run us through the key areas of the heart and day-to-day -day cardiology. Let me introduce myself. I'm Lucas Willim, a senior developer of BodyMap at MAI. And I'll be answering the technical questions in the QA blog after Dr. Gregory Katz. Without further ado, let's dive into the VR space. See you there. All right. So welcome to BodyMap, the place to learn anatomy in the metaverse. The goal of this event is to provide access to experiential and hands-on learning from anywhere. As a note, if you encounter technical issues during the event, please try restarting the BodyMap application and rejoining the class. So today, we will be taking a virtual tour of the heart to see the anatomy of the cardiovascular system up close. We'll use virtual reality to zoom in and see the heart in circulation as you never have before. By the end of this course, you'll have an appreciation of cardiovascular anatomy and the flow of blood through the systemic and pulmonary circulation. We'll see the four cardiac valves, understand the anatomical differences defining the cardiac chambers, and examine the coronary arteries and their distribution to the different parts of the heart. The body map virtual tour allows an up-close view of the anatomy in a way that can only be equaled in a real anatomy lab. So you'll come away with an understanding of the anatomy of these structures and their interconnectedness that isn't possible from a textbook. So I'm super excited to introduce our professor, Dr. Gregory Katz. Dr. Katz is a cardiologist and assistant professor of medicine at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. All right, Dr. Katz, please take us away. Cool, Taylor, thanks so much for, uh, for having me here. Everyone from the audience, feel free call, to call me Greg. I'm a lot less formal than that introduction uh, may have sounded, but the goal here uh, is to use this amazing software to get a little bit of a better understanding of the heart, in particular, how a cardiologist thinks about the heart with regards to a lot of the things that people are going to be coming to see me with. So I see patients all day and I want to walk everybody through how I think about some of the complaints that I will encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as a lot of the common anatomy that I'll see so that we can not just look at the heart from this amazing virtual perspective, but also think about how it relates to actual patients in the real world. And so I think the first place that I'd like to start is just by giving everyone a very big picture understanding of where the heart sits in relation to a lot of other structures in the body. So one of the most common things that I'll have patients come to, to see me with, with a report of is pain or discomfort in their chest area. And while almost everybody who's reporting a symptom like that is worried about pain coming from the heart, there's a ton of other structures that are in that immediate realm. And so just from what we're looking at right now, we see immediately there's the skin of the chest and all of the soft tissue associated with that. The next layer down, is the bone and the muscle. And so any muscular ailment or inflammation of a joint can cause kind of some of these symptoms. And if you go even a little bit deeper, you see the lungs that are really encasing the heart. And the there's no wasted space inside the human body. And so while we look at the heart and it looks like it's just sort of anatomically sitting there with a lot of space around it, in reality, everything's very, very tight. The lungs, the muscles, and the bones are all really intercased without, er, interlaced without much space in between. And so getting into the heart, we're going to just hide all of these other structures. The most outer layer of the heart is this area right here, and it's called the pericardium. The pericardium is a sac around the heart, and it's composed of a couple of different layers. It has... Uh, fibrous sort of outer part. And then there's two inner layers, the parietal layer, which just refers to the outside part, and then the visceral layer, which is the, the inside part. The importance of this sac around the heart evolutionarily is not really clear, but in practice, what it means is that the heart is encased with this protective mechanism. And 
normally the pericardium is not something that, that we're thinking about all that much, but it can have a couple of specific medical problems that it's associated with. And so, you know, in the well, in light of the the pandemic that we've all been dealing with over the last couple of years, one of the the biggest issues that that presents is inflammation of the heart, which is myocarditis, or the sac around the heart, which is termed pericarditis. Pericarditis can cause problems because the inflammation of this sac, this pericardial sac, which is fibrous and not really elastic and doesn't really move is when inflammation happens, fluid accumulates. And because this sac, the pericardium, is so thick and so unable to be distended, that can lead to actual compression of the heart muscle itself. That can lead to blood pressure dropping, and it can cause all kinds of, uh, all, all kinds of issues with blood flow to the other organs of the body, including the, the risk of death. And so the pericardium is something that you very rarely think about, except when you have to think about it. And the issue with it, as I had mentioned, is that it doesn't stretch, it's not distensible, and if you have any issues with it, it can really lead to to compromise of the, the rest of the circulation. The majority of people who are having symptoms of uh, inflammation of the pericardium will report chest pain. That chest pain is characteristically a little bit worse when they're sitting up and a little bit better, or excuse me, a little bit worse when they're lying down and a little bit better when they're sitting up, but everyone's gonna be a little bit different with regards to to that. But going inside the the pericardium, we get to the heart muscle itself. And uh, as a cardiologist, one of the things that I deal with uh, sort of the most on a day-to-day basis is blood flow to the heart. Uh, the coronary arteries in particular. And so coronary is just the, the root that refers to the heart. And arteries are going to be uh, blood vessels that bring blood from the heart to other tissues. And so arteries bringing blood to the heart itself are called the coronary arteries. And so when you hear the term heart disease or coronary artery disease um, or atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. What that really refers to is a problem with the blood vessels around the heart. And those blood vessels are these red structures right here. And so there's three major coronary arteries that I'm thinking about in practice. The first one is right here, which is the right coronary artery, also known as the RCA. The right coronary artery comes off of the aorta right here, and it travels to the right side of the heart, and then to the underneath part of the heart where it gives off a blood vessel called the posterior descending artery or PDA. And that supplies the underside of the heart or the the inferior part of the, the heart wall. And the right coronary artery also gives off these branches called the RV marginal branches that are coming off sort of throughout the, the flow. But the most important thing that the right coronary artery is doing is giving off that posterior descending artery and bringing blood to the underside of the heart, also known uh, as the inferior portion of the heart muscle. The next blood vessel that I'm dealing with is the left main coronary artery. It can be a little bit tough to see, but what I'm gonna do is sort of draw your attention to the little structure in there. And so you see there's this little flap right here that's sitting over the rest of the blood vessels and it's almost obscuring the blood flow. That's called the left atrial appendage, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on when we get into the individual chambers of the heart. But the left atrial appendage sort of obscures the most important artery in the heart, which is the left main coronary artery. And so if everybody can sort of follow where this arrow is going, inside underneath that left atrial appendage. That gets into the left main coronary artery, which will go all the way into the aorta, which is the big blood vessel that is coming off of the heart and giving blood everywhere else in the in the body. The left main coronary artery gives off two major branches. First branch is this one that goes down the front of the heart. And so if we remember where the heart is sitting in the body. We're sitting 
head on. And so where that uh, that's pointing to is really the, the front of the heart, which is a structure called the, the right ventricle. But the left anterior descending artery right here gives blood going down the, the, the front of the heart, and it will give off branches towards both sides. The branches that go towards the right, which are here, are called the septal perforators. And those septal perforating arteries supply a huge amount of the electrical tissue of the heart. And so a blockage to, to, that, blood, to uh, that blood supply can cause a widening of some of the electrical signals on an, on an EKG. The other major branches off of the left anterior descending artery or the LAD are these, which are going to the left side of the heart, and those are called the diagonal branches. You may have heard the left main coronary artery colloquially referred to as the widow maker. And the reason that it's called that is because the left anterior descending artery actually supplies 50% of the blood flow to the whole heart muscle. And so a problem with that left anterior descending artery's blood flow has real potential to cause major damage to the heart. And so it's it, it's one of the, the arteries that we really think most about and what we're, what we're most worried about with respect to development of blockages uh, through the process of hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. The other branch of the left main coronary artery is this one here called the circumflex artery. And so let me just get my brush here. So the circumflex artery is this red branch right there. And if you look back to the front of the heart, and then we go again towards that left main, right under that left atrial appendage. What you see with the circumflex is it's actually traveling around the back of the heart. And what that means is that it's supplying blood flow that to an area that is really, really tough to see from the surface. And so when you're supplying blood to an area that's not really well seen from the front of the heart, that makes it very, very difficult to pick up issues there on an EKG. And as a consequence of that, circumflex problems can be very, very quiet uh, in terms of the, the EKG abnormalities. And so you really need to have a high index of suspicion for something going on there. The branches off of the circumflex artery are called the obtuse marginals or OMs, and you can see a couple of them coming off, and there are usually two or three OMs, and sometimes the OMs themselves are actually a little bit bigger than the circumflex and supply a little bit more tissue than the full circumflex artery. So we have the three major coronary arteries coming off of the heart, and again, that's the right coronary artery here, which is going to the inferior or underside of the heart, right here through its branch called the posterior descending artery or PDA. And then we have coming off of the left main coronary artery hidden underneath that left atrial appendage, we have the left anterior descending artery or the LAD, also known as the Widowmaker. And we have the circumflex artery coming off and the circumflex artery going all the way around the back of the heart. And so, the coronary arteries are a huge amount of what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and problems with the coronary arteries build up over a long period of time, often years, if not decades. And uh, if you end up developing blockages or blood clots in those arteries, that's what leads to a heart attack. And so the vast majority of people that I see on a day-to-day -day basis are dealing with problems in those blood vessels that are brought on by high blood pressure and diabetes and smoking and high cholesterol that's happened over years and years and years. And understanding that anatomy very, very precisely lets you identify the inferior part of the heart, the anterior part of the heart, and the posterior part of the heart through those three different arteries. And when you're looking at an EKG, you're able to localize what you think is going on based on which areas of the, of the heart seem to be involved. Moving on from the coronary arteries, I wanna get a little bit more into the structure of the different cardiac chambers. So when blood flow comes to the heart, it comes through two blood supplies. One is the inferior 
superior vena cava right here, which brings blood from the bottom part of the body up towards the heart. The other one is the superior vena cava right here, or SVC, which brings blood from the top of the body back towards the heart. The superior and inferior vena cava drain into a chamber called the right atrium. And the right atrium also has a little appendage or ear, which you can see here. It's located on the front of the heart, not to be confused, the left atrial appendage, which is more in the back of the heart. The, we're gonna get into a little bit of the cross section here right now. And what I'd like to do actually, before we even do that, is take a look at the right atrium itself. We're gonna pull it out from the rest of the heart. And we're gonna see the blood flow comes into the right atrium. The right atrium is this tiny, thin-walled structure. And if you look on the inside here, you can really see how thin the walls are and how just sort of soft and pliable that might be. We get into the valve leading out of the right atrium down into the right ventricle. And that's a valve called the tricuspid valve. It's called tricuspid because it has three different, uh, three different cusps or three different leaflets that, uh, that, are, that are on it. And there's one that's located near the septum, which is called the septal leaflet. There's one near the front of the heart, which is called the anterior leaflet. And then there's one near the back of the heart, which is called the posterior leaflet. A very common type of irregular heartbeat called atrial flutter actually tends to occur through this area right here between where the inferior vena cava comes into the heart and where the tricuspid valve is located. That area is called the cavotricuspid isthmus or CTI. That's a very, very important area when it comes to dealing with people who have irregular heartbeats because People who are coming in with atrial flutter, which is a fairly common type of irregular heartbeat, will have this area of the heart very, very easily affected. And the reason that that matters clinically is if we go back to kind of where the right atrium is and we think about how we would fix a problem there, what we basically do is we put a catheter into one of the blood vessels in the leg. We'd follow that all the way up towards the that all the way up towards the inferior vena cava. And then we're able to get in just through that inferior vena cava, put that catheter right at the cavotricuspid isthmus. And we can use a, a very precise electrical signal to burn the cavotricuspid isthmus through a procedure called an ablation. And that can essentially cure somebody of the irregular heartbeat called atrial flutter. It's an amazingly cool procedure. So put that back and we can Just get one, into the... One little sorry. note to everyone who's watching. If you want to get up close, uh, in case you haven't explored the controls, using the side grip buttons, if you can see how I'm moving here, you can really get up close. And don't worry, you won't be getting in anyone's way. So you can really get up here and look at what uh, Dr. Katz is pointing out. And so I'm going to put the heart into cross section right now because I think that you can really get a great appreciation for a lot of the things that we're talking about when you see the heart in cross section. And so we had, I want to just reorient everybody. And so we had previously looked at the flow of blood and looked at the area of the inferior vena cava draining blood from the bottom of the body and the superior vena cava draining blood from the top of the body and going into the right atrium. The right atrium then drains blood down into the right ventricle, passing through the tricuspid valve, which is right here. And that tricuspid valve has three leaflets, which you can really see quite well if you're looking at it in a uh, cross section right here, where there's one leaflet near this part of the heart called the septum, which is the thing, the muscle that separates the right side of the heart from the left side of the heart. And then there are anterior and posterior leaflets. The valves are connected to the heart muscle itself through these little strings. And those strings are called chordae, and then they attach into muscles that connect to the rest of the heart, and those muscles are called papillary muscles. 
that can be important when thinking about some heart valve problems. But uh, for for the most part, I think that we'll we'll kind of move on from what that means clinically. The right ventricle is one of the two major chambers on the bottom part of the heart. The atria are in the top part of the heart. Uh, singular, it means it's singular. The singular term for the top chambers is atrium, and when it's plural, it's atria. And so we have the right atrium here going into the right ventricle here. The other side of the heart, we have the left atrium, which is in here, going into the left ventricle down here. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs, and the left ventricle pumps blood to the rest of the body. The right ventricle is a much thinner walled structure than the left ventricle is. That is important because the right ventricle has to pump against a much lower pressure of blood than the uh, than the left ventricle does. And so, for one of the uh, somewhat common uh, conditions that that I'll be treating is something called pulmonary hypertension, which refers to an elevated blood pressure in the lungs. That causes problems because the right ventricle, as you can see right here, is a much thinner walled structure and doesn't have the muscular fortitude to be able to pump against very high pressures. After the blood goes from the right ventricle up into the lungs, it goes through this main pulmonary artery. And again, it's the pulmonary trunk, which you can see labeled right here, is the term for the common pulmonary artery before it branches into a left-sided branch and a right-sided branch. And blood goes from the pulmonary artery into the lungs, where it acquires oxygen. And then it comes back to the heart, and it returns to the back part of the heart, called the left atrium, through the pulmonary veins. You can see there's pulmonary veins on the right side of the body and there's pulmonary veins on the left side of the body that I'm drawing arrows to now. Those pulmonary veins tend to be the area where another type of irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation often starts. And so the procedure to fix atrial fibrillation or the or, the ablation that's used to treat atrial fibrillation is focused on the electrical activity around these pulmonary veins and burning that with catheters in order to isolate the pulmonary veins from the rest of the heart electrically. It's a much more complex procedure, isolating these two large structures versus just burning that small cavotricuspidismus as we were talking about on the right side of the heart. And going and thinking about that procedure and thinking about the anatomy of how these chambers are are all interrelated is very very helpful when you're consider when you're counseling patients about how the safety of and the complexity of the different procedures that that we would be considering. And so, I want to just draw your attention again to where we're located with the left atrium relative to the rest of the body. And so, if you go back to this front part of the heart what you can see is the right ventricle is the most anterior part of the heart, the part of the heart that's most in the front. And then the left atrium, where the blood flow comes back from the lungs, is in the very back of the heart. And so the fact that it's in the back of the heart leads to a lot of complexity when you're trying to take pictures of it non-invasively. So a very common procedure that we'll do from a cardiology perspective is a test called a transesophageal echocardiogram, where we actually will put the put a camera into somebody's mouth, bring it all the way down into their esophagus so that we're looking at the left atrium from the back of the heart. And that matters quite a bit when we're thinking about one of the major complications of the irregular heartbeat called atrial fibrillation, which is a blood clot developing in this area called the left atrial appendage, sometimes called the left auricle, which as you can see is in the back part of the heart. So if a blood clot is forming there and you wanna be able to take pictures of it, taking a picture from the surface of the heart or the, uh, the front of the chest often doesn't get the resolution that you need. And so looking to the back part of the heart for how you're going to, to image for blood clots can be of a huge amount of importance. From the left atrium, after the blood returns there from the lungs, we then pass through 
the mitral valve here before we get into the left ventricle. The mitral valve is a valve that there are so many doctors who have dedicated their careers to understanding well. It looks so simple. There's these two leaflets, an anterior leaflet and a posterior leaflet. But in reality, the complexity of the mitral valve has to do with how it interfaces with the biggest chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. And so you can see the left ventricle right here has these large muscles that attach to cords of the left H of the mitral valve. And these muscles are called papillary muscles. And the interplay of the muscles with the, the papillary muscles with the rest of the body of the left ventricle and the cords of the mitral valve, and then the mitral valve structure itself, particularly this ring around it called the mitral valve annulus, leads to a situation where you can have problems with that valve that are related to the valve itself, but you can also have problems with that valve that are related to problems with the left ventricle. And the interplay between the mitral valve and the rest of the heart muscle is incredibly complex. And again, there are people who spend their entire careers just dedicated to understanding the mitral valve, which when we're just looking at it right here, it just looks so simple. It's almost hard to believe that it, there could be so much complexity with it. Then this chamber here, the left ventricle, is the biggest, most the thickest muscle and the strongest chamber of the heart. It's the chamber that pumps blood through this area called the aortic valve into the aorta, which is the big blood vessel leading to the rest of the body. When we're looking at this left ventricle, you can see the muscle is so thick and it's beating so forcefully. We measure how strong the left ventricle is with something called the ejection fraction. When the ejection fraction goes down, that's often a sign of a type of congestive heart failure called heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, which has a high risk of sudden cardiac death. For patients who have a low ejection fraction, we're putting them on numerous different types of medical treatments, as well as considering uh, devices that are implanted in the heart, like potentially a defibrillator or a special type of pacemaker. And so moving at a cross section. So I think we left off with blood flow coming to the left ventricle and then going out to the rest of the body. And so I wanna draw everyone's attention to this big blood vessel right there. And so you can see this gigantic blood vessel is coming up from the heart and then it goes up and it has this arch and then it goes down to the whole body. And so you can see the, this is the aorta, and the aorta gives off blood flow to everything else in the body. And so we can see the blood flow coming off, the blood vessels coming off and going to the heart. Then when we come around the arch, we can see blood vessels going off and then going upwards. And these blood vessels are going to go to the brain. And then you see the aorta coming all the way around the back, and then it's going to go all down the back part of the body where it's going to give off branches that I think you can see kind of all of these little areas coming off of it that would be uh, home to branches to supply every organ of the entire body. And so problems with the aortic valve, which is the valve that is separating the left ventricle to the aorta itself, can cause all kinds of problems with blood flow going to, to the rest of the body. I think it's worth just sort of taking a step back. We had talked about a number of different valves of the, the heart. The heart has four valves, and the purpose of those valves is to essentially serve as doors so that blood flows in the correct direction forward and doesn't flow backwards. Valves of the heart can have two major problems. They can become too tight if they develop deposits of calcium, and that can lead to congestive heart failure, or they can become leaky, which will lead to blood flow going back that should be going forward. And when blood flow is going back that should be going forward, the heart actually will become dilated, and uh, that will be the first step of uh, kind of a compensation mechanism. And then over a longer period of time, the heart can actually get bigger and swell if the, if the valve leakiness gets too bad, and that can develop into heart failure as well. We had mentioned earlier that this area in the back of the heart, the left atrial appendage, which is this 
sort of piece of the left atrium that's looking a little bit like an ear has a likelihood of developing blood clots, especially if people are in irregular heartbeats. And so the reason that irregular heartbeats matter and a large part of what, what I'm treating on a day-to-day -day basis is thinking about preventing blood clots because those blood clots can break off from the left atrial appendage. They can travel down into the left ventricle and then up through the aorta where they can essentially go anywhere else in the body. And if a blood clot breaks off of the left atrial appendage and it goes up to the aorta and then off of one of those blood vessels, it can go to the brain and cause a stroke. If it goes to one of the arteries around the heart, which is a little bit harder just based on what the angle it would need to, to be going at, it would need to almost make a right turn uh, to get into one of those arteries, but it can, and sometimes that happens, it can cause a heart attack. Or it can go over the arch of the aorta and then essentially anywhere else to the rest of the body and cause an infarction or a blockage in blood flow to, to that area. And so thinking about the circulation where you have blood coming back in, coming into the heart, into the right atrium, and then into the right ventricle, and then up into the lungs through this pulmonary artery, and then back to the reverse part of the heart where it comes into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins, then down into the largest chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, and then up through there to the aorta, you have the flow of blood everywhere. And so I think now might be a good time to, to pause and take questions and just sort of reiterate some of the things that, that we'd gone through. So we talked about the layers of tissue around the heart called the pericardium. We talked about the arteries to the heart called the coronary arteries that can become blocked in the setting of heart disease. We talked about the different chambers of the heart, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. We talked about the tricuspid valve, the mitral valve, and the, aor the aortic valve, and some of the associated problems that can happen with that. We talked about the most common location of blood, blood clots in the heart, the left atrial appendage right there. Then we went through the circulation to, to the upper part of the body through the branches of the aorta that go up to the head, neck, and brain. Then we talked about blood flow to the bottom half of the body through the branches of the lower part of the aorta. And so we went through a lot. Uh, I'd like to pause and uh, answer any questions that, that you might have or give Taylor a chance to answer questions about uh, the VR system itself. Hope you guys found that interesting. Great. So everyone should be elevated. You should all be able to see each other now. If you take a look around. All right, here we go. So if you'd like to speak, just go ahead and on your side panel, click the mic, and that'll send me a note to add voice permissions. So it looks like Alistair just asked for permissions. Can you hear us, Alistair? Yes, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, I, I suppose I have somewhat of a layperson's question, but I, I think something that definitely struck me during this presentation was the number of ways the heart can go wrong. So... I guess I'd like to take the opportunity to ask a cardiologist, what would you say is general good practice for keeping yourself healthy over a long period of time? That's a loaded question. Uh, there's, <laughs> the, so there's like the, the common stuff, which is mm. don't eat junk food, make sure you get sleep, uh, exercise, maintaining a healthy weight, not smoking. You can get mm. into a ton of complexity with, with all of those things. And so when I'm counseling patients about healthy lifestyle. I always frame heart disease from the perspective of this is something that takes decades to happen. It's not something mm. that happens over the course of days and weeks. And so thinking about a time course of decades, and I kind of think about all of the different things that increase your risk of heart disease. And I start with smoking. I get into high blood pressure, high blood sugar, even if it's not frank diabetes, high cholesterol. Um, and I think about each of those things as being an exposure over time, meaning mm. it's area under the curve. It's not just a snippet of time. And so I think about all of those risk factors and how do we best control them over, over the years and decades. And then you get into things like stress, sleep, nutrition, and nutrition is a topic that you could spend a ton of hours on, on its own. Um, I think that there's uh, people get very uh, almost religious about uh, what they think constitutes a healthy diet. 
And I think mm. if you look across different populations and across different schools of thought, you get left with what are the common threads among all of the, the different dietary philosophies. And I think that all of the sort of dietary philosophies that seem to have good outcomes will say that sugar is probably bad for you. Processed food is probably bad for you. And the, my definition of processed food would be something that you can keep in the house for a week and it doesn't spoil without refrigeration. Mm. And that's I, not, I'm not including like dried beans and rice in that, but I think that we most of us know what uh, what processed food is. Um, and, you know, the, the the discussion about is meat bad, is salt bad? I tend to come to to a perspective of the the research showing those things are really bad for you is pretty flawed, and I think that mm. practicing moderation with uh, with some of those vices is probably a good idea. But I don't think that um, a vegan diet or a salt free diet is actually healthier than a diet that has some animal products or a little bit of uh, of salt in it. Um, and then, you know, sleep is really, really important. Stress modification and reduction is really important. And uh, and exercise is actually the single thing that probably controls uh, what our health outcomes are more than anything else. And so making sure that you're doing regular aerobic exercise as well as strength training uh, and combating the effects of the decrease in muscle mass that happens as we age is all really, really important stuff. Um, and you know, the one thing that we can't do is pick who our parents are, but if you could, that would actually be pretty influential. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Comprehensively. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to enable everyone's audio here. So it's like a big group discussion. Oh. Um, if you have background noise, yeah, please try to mute fine. yourself. All right, so everyone should be able to speak now. Any questions? Greg, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. <laughs> okay. So first, thank you for the content. Super interesting. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one follow-up question um, regarding the content you just shared. Could you please uh, show again, like, how the blood, um, like, how it flows to the head and how it like through which veins and arteries and yes. the second one refers to the electric signal could you briefly maybe like sum up how actually the signal trans like goes through the heart and uh, how the heart yeah. actually beats so i th think that that's this is actually both of those things is probably best discussed through cross section and so I'm going to draw everyone's attention and I will not use the brush to avoid causing issues, but I'm going to draw everyone's attention. Everyone can see the underside of the heart, the inferior vena cava. Everybody shares yes. able to see yes. that. And then I just, the superior... I muted everyone because of the, there was some background noise, by the way. Got it. So blood flows into the heart initially through the inferior vena cava bringing blood from the bottom of the heart up towards the right atrium and the superior vena cava, which brings blood from the top of the body to the right atrium. Blood flow then goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle, from the right ventricle into the lungs, back from the lungs to the back part of the heart in the left atrium, down from the left atrium, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle up through the aortic valve into the aorta and all over the body. The electrical system of the heart has a couple, uh, has two internal pacemakers and then a number of other wires. And the first pacemaker called the sinoatrial node or SA node is actually located in the top part of the right atrium. That's that first chamber that we saw uh, where the blood comes into the heart. Then there's another pacemaker that is located. Let me see if I can do just a point. There's another pacemaker that's located right there, sort of the crux between the two atria and the two ventricles. And that pacemaker is called the atrioventricular node or AV node. And 
that will lead to the electrical signal being transmitted through the bottom part of the heart or the ventricles. And so you have this kind of like asynchronous uh, con contraction of the heart via the electrical system. And so the SA node or sinoatrial node located in the right atrium is going to give a signal and that's going to make both of the atrium beat at the same time. Then the AV node is going to hear that impulse and then is going to transmit a signal down to the bottom part of the heart through a number of interconnected wires and that's going to make the ventricles beat. And that serves the purpose of having the atrium give blood into the ventricle before to increase the amount of blood that's in the ventricle before the ventricle contracts and brings blood uh, brings blood elsewhere. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? If anyone has a question, please just go ahead and request audio by clicking your mic icon next to your name. Yeah, I can I can try turning it on again and we'll see if background noise starts popping up. All right, mic's on. Maria, Alistair. Right. Yeah, that was incredibly informative. Thank you for that. I think it was really interesting learning about how it's so difficult to get access to the back of the heart and how you have to go through the esophagus to get the picture and then be able to activate the electricity on these areas right here. That's very, very interesting. This is something I never thought about. Yeah, how you get into the different chambers of the heart seems so simple when you're just looking at it. But then you think about the complexity of, you know, if you're going to access the heart, you need to do it either through, a, if you're not doing open heart surgery, you need to do it through a blood vessel. And so thinking about how the blood vessels go to the heart and that there's different risk if you are going through a vein or going through an artery, uh, it really leads to a lot of uh, complexities with regards to procedural planning and with the tools that you need in order to, to get to where you want to go. And so all of these cardiology procedures that are done non-invasively, meaning not with an open heart surgery, are all going through blood vessels to get to the different areas of the heart. And that, pro that, that procedure where we put a camera into the esophagus and we look at the back part of the heart, that's not actually doing anything other than taking pictures. And so you can't modify the heart through that procedure. But what you can do is get a sense of where you should put your wires and catheters through the other blood vessels based on what you're seeing. Got it. Interesting. Wow. Looks like Jorg is taking everything apart here. Thanks for showing us all that. <laughs> So also yeah, as a note, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Great. So congratulations. So you did a lot of work with this. So I saw this software last year and, uh, oh, wow, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the body map team is doing yeah. incredible work. It's the, the, the technology is amazing. You really cannot get an appreciation for how complicated these structures are with many oh tools gosh. outside of dissecting uh, a cadaver. And so this is real. This is a completely revolutionary way of, uh, of looking at the heart. And if you just think about all of the, the different ways that that we image the heart. None of those ways give the ability to manipulate through three-dimensional space the way that this does. And so you can look at all the CAT scans, MRIs, echocardiograms that, that you want, but actually seeing it up close through this technology, is uh, it, it's a completely different experience, and it gives you a different sense of how things are interrelated in three-dimensional space than a lot of our other uh, That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna reactivate. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, I think we can go ahead and end the event here, unless anyone has any further thoughts. 
Um, I have uh, a further <laughs> one further question on, I think it's more on the clinical side uh, from your experience, Greg, how, um, how people or your patients actually react when you suggest uh, them to change their diet because of the, uh, yeah, like some problems with their, um, with their, uh, you know, with their heart. Was, people yeah. react, people react in, uh, in an agreeable sense, meaning they they say that, yeah, my diet stinks and I know I should change it. Um, and so their reaction is fine, but people's behavior almost never changes. Very, very, I, I have had a handful of successes of patients who have made major changes to their diet and to their exercise regimen and who have really done a huge amount to either stop the progression or even to reverse their heart disease. But the vast majority of people value Oreos and Doritos more than they do exercise. <laughs> and they would rather take more medicine and continue. That's just from my day-to-day -day experience. Um, and if you, if you ask people, would you rather take more medicine or would you rather change your diet? Almost everybody will say, I would rather change my diet. But in practice, most people don't change their diet and they end up with, uh, with medicine as a result. Most of what I do would be able to be prevented or treated with changes to lifestyle. And when I say lifestyle, that includes diet, exercise, stress reduction, sleep, socialization, wow. natural sunlight, kind of all day-to-day -day things. Uh, there's this concept in economics called revealed preference, which is that uh, people actually prefer the things that they do, not the things that they say they prefer. And so my, my interpretation of the reveal of people's revealed preference in a, in a clinical sense is that most people value uh, junk food over heart health. <laughs> yep. Very interesting. That's amazing hey, to Katz. know that just yeah, it can be prevented. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Yeah. I was wondering if you have ever had any thoughts around using this type of a software with patients. Like maybe if it if there could be an evolution to this where you show them what's going on inside of their heart or inside of their body, have you ever thought they, of anything like that? If I if I was doing a lot of procedural planning, it would be really really useful. Um, I I'm not a proceduralist. I'm a, okay. I'm a clinical doctor, and so most of what I I I mean I think that there's there's value in terms of showing people like where the problem is. Um, I think that the there's a lot more value in terms of dealing with patients when you're thinking about uh, what the procedures are like and where those procedures are going because it's actually sticking things into the body versus most of what I am showing people, I feel like I can explain pretty similarly with a picture versus uh, versus with this. Um, but if I was a proceduralist and I was placing valves or I was doing catheterizations, that would, uh, cool. All right. Nice. Good question. Good question. Um, all right. We're basically right at the top of the hour here. So I guess we can go ahead and call it and if anyone has questions feel free to just email on the the chain that you received earlier uh, to get in touch with the body map team and uh, if you're interested to continue using the software <laughs> someone's going uh, if you're interested to continue <laughs> using the software uh, please just reach out to us as well uh, there's some interesting new announcements around some uh, more affordable pricing for students um, so happy to share that with everyone as well and until the next virtual event, hope everyone has a good one.